we'll have about a 30 to 35 minutes lecture from Anouk, after which we'll have Q&A. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A symbol downstairs on your bar at the bottom of the page. And you can write your questions and I'll relate to them at the Q&A part. Um, let me start by introducing Anouk Wiprecht, which is a Dutch fashion tech designer, engineer and in innovator, living in Miami currently. Uh, Anouk is working in the field of wearable robotics with a focus on behavioral aspects uh, of the interaction of body-based electronic design. She wants her garments to facilitate and augment the interactions we have with ourselves and our surrounding. Her spider dress is a perfect example of this aesthetics where sensors and movable arms on the dress help to create a more defined boundary of the personal space while employing a fierce style. Um, Anouk has partnered up with companies such as Intel, Autodesk, Google, Arduino, uh, Microsoft, Samsung, Adobe, Adidas, Cirque du Soleil, Audi, Disney, Swarovski, and Shapeways, mm -hmm. the 3D printing company. I know that's a really impressive like set, <laughs> set of companies. Uh, her works have showcased uh, in various design weeks and uh, are exhibiting in, just to name a few, uh, the Vitra Museum, the v &A Museum, the Ars Electronica Center, and the Museum for Science and Technology, really just to name a few. So without further delay, um, I'll pass the floor to Anouk Wiprecht, and the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you so much for that um, uh, introduction, and thank you so much for, uh, for having me. I'm going to share my screen so I can uh, start my presentation. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Odi, for the um, introduction. Yeah, El, thank you so much for the uh, invitation. And uh, yeah, I'm um, a fashion designer, fashion tech designer, so I combine uh, fashion with electronics. I'm from the Netherlands originally. Um, so. Um, I started when I was 14 years old with fashion design. When I was uh, 17 years old, I cut in robotics because I think robots are really cool. Um, and I started to combine that. For me, fashion is something that is very expressive, something that uh, can communicate something uh, very personal about yourself or maybe something cultural and all of that stuff. So I got really fascinated by that early on in my life. And I started to combine that with my fascination for robots. So I started at the beginning of 2000. Uh, so yeah around 20 years ago uh, with um, with combining this um, technology was really big at that time uh, so of course we live in an, uh, a time that the technology is really small so it's much easier to uh, embed on the body uh, so that uh, definitely helped my uh, my design uh, research in there so I use um, yeah I use I use a lot of things like uh, yeah coding uh, programming languages um, uh, AI machine learning uh, where where it needs to I always say uh, might you not need to use AI or might you not need to data mine don't do it because <clears throat> it might uh, it's not always the solution for everything but it definitely speeds up things um, yeah if you're working around the body for certain sets of data that you want to uh, sort of yeah, uh, examine and um, analyze. And then in my case, it will respond to things which I will um, explain you in my lecture. You can find me online if you have any questions, especially if you're getting into electronics and, uh, and all of that stuff. Uh, ask me uh, a question about how to do that. Uh, feel free to uh, email me about that. Uh, maybe if you want to know what kind of microcontroller you need to use for a certain project or um, a recommendation for a sensor, always feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to help. So my research is about um, two things, the body itself and also the spaces around the body. So you can think of the intimate distance, the personal distance, the social distance, and the public distance. And these are spaces that we have all around us. Um, and that is based on the proxemics theory of Edward T. Hall. He was uh, notifying that um, 
and this is Edward T. Hall. Um, he wrote, wrote about this in his book, The Hidden Dimension. He was noticing, he was, um, I think, traveling around and noticing that different people have different uh, personal spaces and that he found really interesting. So he was measuring this with a wooden stick. He was measuring these uh, spaces from person to person. Um, I got into this uh, research in halfway 2000 and I, I thought it was really fascinating. Instead of using the analog, the wooden stick, what I do is I use uh, proximity sensors, so distance sensors. And I do the same research, um, but using these uh, proximity sensors instead. So his analog research, I, I do that more uh, through uh, digital means. So my systems are measuring these spaces. So uh, they are measuring up to 25 feet or eight meters. And um, uh, one of the examples in where I use this uh, distance sensing and measuring the surroundings is uh, my spider dress that you can also see behind me. Um, it's a robotic spider dress that um, acts on people that are approaching in one of these spaces and um, it's uh, literally a text. There are um, yeah, robotic elements, there are little servo motors in the shoulders. And basically this, um, yeah, this dress is uh, maybe basically um, examining, observing what is going on in the surroundings, analyzing this, and then it's reacting to that. So that is how my system works. My system uh, doesn't only react in one way, just attacking. I programmed something that I call 12 states of behavior. So the, depending on the interaction with this dress, uh, the dress is reacting differently. So when you um, are uh, walking up in a nice speed, the dress is like uh, making you aware that you're coming closer, but maybe be not super aggressively. If you walk up very close by, the, re the system is reacting much more um, aggressively. So I defined all these, uh, these um, states in between and uh, based on what uh, the, data, the data that's coming in, what's being observed, um, it's reacting in a different way. So here you can see how that, um, how that looks like. So this was a project that I did in 2015 when I was working at um, Intel. Uh, Intel is the big semiconductor company uh, in Portland. So I was working at their headquarter and um, they had a new device coming out, uh, the Intel Edison, a new uh, yeah, computer platform that they wanted to see how they can uh, work with makers and uh, yeah, architects and designers and all of that stuff. So I was one of the people that worked at Intel for two years, uh, making several designs based on their, uh, their platform. We showed this dress and other dresses and um, also some devices. Um, I, I helped a lot with the new devices group. Um, we show this at CES and this is a little movie uh, on that. Sometimes I like to hide the electronics so you don't see all the wires and all of that stuff. But we wanted to make the spider dress a very educational kind of, um, um, yeah, a very educational kind of design. And uh, this is why you see everything uh, yeah, popping out because I wanted to make it explainable to my grandmother, but also uh, to a little child that might be six years old and that's interested in, oh, how, where are these sensors? Where are they going to, you know? Uh, okay, uh, what is happening here? And you can easily explain it. So not only an, an uh, sort of an aesthetic design uh, and a smart design, but also a very educative design um, it became. So you can see all the wires going into the back piece. You can see the um, respiration sensors in the design, in the side part. You can see the proximity sensors in the front. And um, we also created some robotic spiders uh, for on the maker fairs for children. They could program the spiders and they could make them dance sort of. And um, yeah, the, 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 the spiders um, had some uh, machine learning in there. So I combined uh, yeah, all of these uh, yeah, technologies on the body with uh, 3D printing. I'm using 3D printing and um, and yeah, a lot of coding. So another of my designs is the, um, the um, uh, sensoric uh, smoke dress. It works based on another um, animal, the octopus or the ink fish, uh, we call it in the Netherlands. It pushes out ink and it dives away. And uh, that is what this dress is based on. Um, it has uh, sensors and it, other than uh, measuring somebody stepping into the personal space or like the spider dress, uh, this dress is measuring the amount of people in the direct surroundings of the dress and the more people there are in the direct surroundings of the dress, more smoke comes out. So it's almost like an, a smoke screen. So uh, this dress uh, was the first design that I 3D printed uh, in PA12. Uh, there was a new technique. This was uh, 12 years ago, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, called uh, thermoplastic polyurethane. So it was the first time that uh, designers like me could uh, 3D print in a rubber-like material. So an, uh, like almost making uh, more flexible prints than hard shell. So that's over the process called uh, selective lace sintering. 
and uh, this became that dress. So the dress, uh, yeah, notes when there are people in the surroundings and it starts to uh, to smoke. This was in the studio. I was just testing it out, and then um, it became part of the show at uh, for Volkswagen in 2012. So there was an, a big uh, showcase with, um, I believe, six designs, and they were all working on electronics, uh, lightening up, moving, uh, hip elements, removing all of that stuff, and also the smoke dress. So they needed to uh, work, uh, yeah, uh, partially uh, like autonomous um, while walking around the booth, but also when they stepped into the show floor, they uh, switched on, uh, yeah, showcase mode. Another design I created for Cirque du Soleil, uh, we know Cirque du Soleil from the theater. Um, they also um, have uh, other concepts in, for example, restaurants and nightclubs and also the fashion week. So I collaborate with Cirque du Soleil, not for the theater, but for things around it where these uh, yeah, designs and their experience just step out of the theater into the real world. So I created for them an, a cocktail dress. So it's a dress based on a peristaltic pump. And uh, it basically creates, uh, yeah, drinks, cocktails based on, uh, like, uh, some, uh, yeah, of the identity. The, the system is uh, asking questions, and then based on uh, the answers, you uh, you get a drink. So this uh, design uh, we presented at Hearta Pizza in um, in um, in Spain, um, and. Yeah, Cirque du Soleil has a uh, restaurant there and uh, yeah, boys and girls, they were like walking around surfing these uh, these rings. So with my research, I um, examine if and when we put technology on the body, what does it do? Um, how can it become social and playful? How can it become defensive and behavioral? How can it be expressive and emotive? And uh, basically I create these little uh, case studies, uh, sometimes by myself, sometimes with uh, companies. And I create these case studies around um, if and when technology becomes um, electronic and digital almost and um, yeah really seeing fashion as an interface so something that can express us that can uh, create a playful interaction with the surroundings that can research something and i think one of the important things is uh, whether uh, i work as an artist i might be able to do more but if i'm working for uh, companies uh, which i'm not showing at this moment uh, i work uh, for google uh, if they have um, products in regards to garments and uh, or, or there's a new device or something you always uh, can ask yourself the question if you're a designer can I make an, uh, something that can be non-invasive? There's a lot of like invasive kind of style uh, devices and technologies out there, but how can you as a designer or as an engineer uh, choose something that might be uh, non-invasive? One of the projects was uh, last year, it was um, the time of COVID and my, my uh, research in um, yeah, sort of social distancing and proximity sensors became very recent. So I made this, um, yeah, this dress for myself. I was in Florida, people were not knowing exactly what uh, sort of one and a half meter was or six feet. So I made, it, uh, made a dress uh, based on that, uh, that notion. It was a dress when people uh, were in an, uh, close surroundings of one and a half meter, these um, hip parts went out. So so when I was wearing that, when I go to a park or to some place, uh, um, I could basically uh, yeah, show people um, that they were too close in my personal space without really saying like, hey, you're coming too close. It was more my system was indicating that this person was uh, coming too close. I could um, have solved the notion of sensing people, um, how many people and where they were in, in the uh, direct mm -hmm. surroundings of the space using a camera, which would be for me, uh, for example, a non, uh, would be an invasive kind of way to uh, measure people, especially in public spaces. So instead what I did was, um, measuring these spaces so again the intimate space uh, the personal space which um, has to do with the social distancing measurements and the social and the public space um, i was measuring these um, uh, spaces with a uh, proximity sensor so the problem with the proximity sensor is that um, um, this is basically how you measure it if i'm using ultrasonic range finders you can um, see things moving into the space you cannot really see if it's a person or a tree or whatever that can be sort of you know so with a camera I would have been able to solve that, uh, which I did not want to use. So instead, um, what you have with the proximity sensor, the distance to people, the speed to people, can you see how many people, or if something is a tree or an object, um, I cannot see because I can just see anything and everything that comes in the uh, surrounding of the sensor. 
So I started to combine it with a thermal sensor to actually sense uh, bodies in there. So now I could sense uh, both the, um, uh, yeah, sort of that something is in, in the environment, but also that there's a body or a human in there. So the thermal sensor could not uh, sense the distance to the person or the speed of the person, but it could sense how many people or that something might not be a human body because of the, the thermal sensing. So what I did instead of using the camera, I overlaid two uh, sensors over each other. So using a proximity sensor to detect things and how, how far they are in the space and using a thermal sensor to see if those things that are in the space are bodies, are actual bodies or not. So that is for me a way to uh, to go around the notion of I could have solved this easy if I would use an um, yeah use a camera, but it might take a little bit more effort and and like yeah sort of analytics and and, and like yeah measurement overlays and all of that stuff. Uh, but then I have a more non-invasive way of measuring this uh, situation, and I think that is really important. Even if uh, things take a little bit more time to develop this way, it is really worth your uh, investment because if you can create an yeah, non-intrusive piece of technology by doing so, then I think that's really important for society. So that's always really important for designers and engineers and whoever to, to think about while you're creating a device, basically. The last topic um, that uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, body signals. So I measured, uh, I already told you about measuring the surroundings. I'm also measuring the body. So you can think of uh, EEG, you can think of uh, pulse, EMG, muscle contraction, EDA, galvanic skin response, uh, respiration. So the measurements of the lungs are really interesting if you're after emotional uh, data. Um, HRV, um, heart rate and heart volume is interesting. It's more rational for me. Uh, temperature, uh, oxygen. So there's a lot of ways that you can measure the body and they all basically want to be measured at a different part of the of the body which makes it really interesting for um uh yeah things like um ai or, or, or machine learning or even deep learning to uh put uh yeah to put focus on this almost so one of the things that we did at Intel was um, I created this dress and what I wanted to do is I wanted to measure the, the stress levels of, um, in, in this case, my model, her name is Whitney. And um, we had the Intel developer conference, so it was on a show floor. So we had the allowance to have her like walk around, maybe see a friend, see something that's interesting to her and um, yeah, uh, measure her her doing so as she was walking over the uh, show floor so again i was using the intel edison this was 2014 or 2013 while i was working for intel um i, I connected it to an hacked um neurosky like an um, eeg device which for me later on was more about emg uh, more muscle contraction than it was about eeg so really brain signals uh because of just yeah the way that you measure things on the frontal part of the head versus the back part of the head i will tell you something more about that later um, so there was a camera involved and embedded into this design and um, basically it was recording whatever was happening in front of uh, my, my wearer, my model, and it was also uh, like correlating that to uh, whatever body signals was, was going on. So um, it had proximity sensors, so it could basically see what was happening around her. It could see how her body was reacting and it could see actually physically what was happening through the use of the camera. Um, that was kind of interesting because uh, I got to know more about uh, like, yeah, just the notion of like uh, body signals, um, stress levels, correlations to the things that are happening into the environment. And I thought that was really interesting. So later on, when I was working at um, Intel uh, at uh, Ars Electronica, I got invited as an artist in residency at Ars Electronica in Linz, which is a uh, really great uh, like yeah media sort of institute. Uh, it has been around for I think 40 years. Uh, Future Lab has been around for 25 years, and that was uh, the part that I was uh, invited to do a residency for the European Commission and the Start Prize. So I wanted to take this notion of this dress that I just created that I showed you and uh, measuring stress levels. Um, I wanted to put this in a device um, because, um, yeah, making a dress uh, just that can be worn by one person uh, was not really interesting for me uh, in the end. So what I did instead is, um, yeah, I focused on a device and um, also I focused on uh, working with children and especially children with ADHD because um, I thought it was interesting to work with brain signals and use and address the focus of uh, what we can measure with uh, using uh, brain signals and EEG. So what I proposed to do was uh, creating an, uh, a brain computer interface um, that has a little camera in the front of the design and uh, the camera measures and notices uh, what whatever is happening in the surroundings 
And um, then I was doing research on how to best connect it to um, EEG, so uh, measuring brain signals. What I did not want to do was measuring a child in a white room in a hospital setting with a doctor, uh, because I don't think it's really yeah, comfortable maybe for the child uh, to be measured that way or to have a device like that. So my first um, yeah, the process, my first part in that process was to limit the 64 electrodes that are normally being used in a medical EEG, this is called the 1020 system and uh, seeing if we could like limit the um, amount of electrodes so it's more easy to put into a design and ideally i wanted to make a design that i could put on and put off so the child could do that in an easy manner sort of so uh through uh, like a neurosciences department in linz um they advised me on using the p300 so the p3 wave of the uh, event related potential uh, because this would address the notion of uh, measuring focus um they were not sure about like limiting the 64 electrodes to only using eight um but it was worth to try so i got connected with gtech a medical eg company in linz and um, we actually started to try this out and figure this out and it's uh, it's actually worked so we went from 64 electrodes to uh, having really reliable data using eight electrodes putting that back into the design which you can see here um, this is the final design of agent unicorn in the museum when you're prototyping it looks a little bit more like frankenstein <laughs> so it looks uh, not that polished of course you know so i also want to be true to nature in that and then you're embedding it sort of you know but uh, yeah a lot of testing it um, actually became a really cool product it's one of my favorite products you see two of the horns behind me right now because um yeah what i wanted to prove out was that um, basically everything and anything around us has an effect on us and if you have adhd so these children um it's a little bit more dramatic right um so what i wanted to show with this design is that um anything and everything has an effect on these kids and um but but what is really affecting them and by working with these kids uh, showing that and showing their own brain signals uh, was really interesting because they learned more about how their brain works and, and possibly how to cope with that. But also like what they focus on, you know, in an ideal situation, I always said like you take this design to, an, to a zoo where you can see animals and at the end of the day, you can of course like see the, the favorite animals and ice cream and all the things that the child enjoyed or like buy uh, or like or got, got afraid of or whatever happened sort of you know so you can really mood map out your day almost um so that became a really interesting like almost like research instrument the other thing what we did with uh, the company of gtech is actually because we proven uh, proven out that uh, using the eight electrodes in the p3 setting was actually really effective we brought it out as a device so you can find it on unicornbi.com it's a medical grade device uh, that uh, that uh, yeah you can do research with um, in uh, in all the things that i that i mentioned before um, and we are also doing hackathons around it so this is the brain.io hackathon this is a little bit an older screen it's inspired by agent unicorn and we're doing it all over the world and now also with the time of COVID, we're doing it digital so you can always look um, at these um uh, yeah the names of the cities go to the brain.io website if it happens uh, near you soon again when uh, yeah COVID is a little bit more solved so the last uh, project uh, that i will mention and I think that is the yeah, highest level that we're using AI and machine learning for to process all the data is the Pangolin Skills BCI address. So the company that I worked with before GTEC uh, to create the, the device, the Unicorn BI, uh, GTEC is a neurotechnology company in Linz. And we uh, teamed up together with uh, Johannes Kepler University in Linz to do the, uh, the other extreme. So we went from 64 to 8 electrodes. Now we went the other way to use 1,024 um, yeah, sensors on the head. So that became the Pangolin um, skills project so uh, basically it is an uh, address that has uh, 64 um, actuators and um, it's uh, it makes light and it makes movements uh, but what you can see here on uh, on Dalietta, her head is uh, one of the, the sensing units of the bci so basically we had an uh, address uh, connected uh, to the um, to the brain waves in a direct um, uh, setting so everybody came out with so when it went into the media it went out into a sort of an, an address that can read minds uh, which i was in the beginning a little bit offended by but in the end of course it, it does that but it was um and i'm trying to show you the um the sensor yeah here so this is the the pangolin uh, grid that uh, yekau and gtech um, uh, created for this so it is uh, 64 uh, basically um yeah sort of pcbs that are um attached to the head and um every pcb has 16 um yeah sensor uh, parts 
um, so it makes 1024 channels. So in my case, uh, we create this dress and every um, signal that we get in is connected to one of the actuators of the dress. So it's in real life um, demonstration of um, yeah, the direct connection between any of these signals and the dress. So you can uh, you can find that online, but um, basically what we did and also during our Electronica festival last year we had our model uh, Maggie, which you can see here she was demonstrating the dress and basically when you go into a more um, yeah hectic state of mind the dress uh, starts to blink uh, white light uh, starts really like sparkle because of all the uh, things that are happening using uh, the, the the BCI and uh, the output as being the dress uh, when she goes more in a neutral state of mind like the dress is calming down, goes more blue, goes more flowy. And when she goes into like a more meditative state of mind, the dress turns purple. And uh, you can basically really see her yeah, state of mind uh, by looking at the dress and looking at the colors and the movements of this dress. So um, in this case, it's currently not a wearable system. <laughs> like she's connected to a big computer because of all the processing and all of that stuff. But uh, we are trying to create uh, this to be a more um, yeah, units that are more uh, wireless and, uh, and all of that stuff in the next step. But uh, it's a really interesting project in, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, yeah, all the data sort of, you know, and, um, and so what we can do with that, uh, of course, the more yeah, sensor points in this case, the more we can, uh, the better the re resolution of the data, the more we can, uh, we can gather there almost. So, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that um, working with, um, uh, yeah, sort of AI, machine learning, deep learning, all of this stuff, um, often you like you need an entry point. So if you um, are yourself not uh, in, into this field already, body signals can be really interesting, like because the first part of like, yeah, sort of analyze, analyzing and, and examining um, anything has to do with data. So data you can get from many points, but I think, uh, yeah, working with body sensors and body data is, or can be really interesting. And uh, these sensors are, uh, yeah, pretty, uh, you can connect them to like a Raspberry Pi or something like that or whatever uh, processor you want to use. So definitely if you want to look into working more with, uh, with uh, yeah, coding and, and all of this stuff, um, I would recommend to also, uh, yeah, look into working with, uh, with body signals because, um, I think it's pretty interesting. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, you can find more on uh, my website. And if you have any questions uh, on, on things, uh, you can also use the email address that is uh, on my screen. And I'm going to stop it sharing. Or in case there are any I, questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that we have any questions. The only question we have is from the previous session, which which kind of raises, brings us, uh, uh, well, I get the privilege of asking you questions, which I feel quite lucky to be at the point. In our previous session, um, Dr. David Fadelson was saying that animals are a good model for smart objects. And he was relating to that in the context of horses as the model to look into when you're trying to um, to design the interaction in autonomous vehicles. And I've noticed while looking at your works that all of your concepts are based on animals. I mean, from the pangolinium, well, unicorns are kind of an animal. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure whether I should really relate to unicorns as a real animal, but the spider dress, um, the smoke dress, they're all based on animals. Though you look at human interactions. Yeah, um, I think um, I think a lot of the things that we create, um, especially if you look at um, AI and especially if you look at robotics are modeled after humans, right? For a long time because that's how it's how it basically started from from uh, both sides and um i think um what i'm busy with is uh, a lot of fields of biomimicry so looking at uh, nature looking at plants but also looking at animals in my specific case looking at uh, behavioral elements of animals um, how do they socialize how they do how do they um, attack and all of that stuff and for me that is a little bit more interesting because um 
I think it has been uh, done less and I think there's a lot uh, that we can of course learn from uh, animal intelligence and um, animal behavior um, yeah from a lot of the inventions that we use everything is um, inspired by, uh, by by nature almost from the velcro to uh, to the ultrasonic range finders that I'm using are, are based on ultrasonic like uh, bats the, the way that mm -hmm. bats use um, uh, yeah sort of their, their, their ways cool. to detect stuff you know so a lot of the things that that we have around us is already based on, uh, on animals in, in some way uh, but I, I do think that yeah we have been looking at uh, like yeah sort of human intelligence and human behavior in, in terms of robotics in from their movements to their behaviors uh, for for a little bit too long <laughs> and I think uh, yeah I think uh, there's there's so much more to explore basically and we're almost in the in the yeah in the shoes of that um, so yeah that's definitely something that that I think um, is, is very interesting mm. and I, I was wondering when looking at your works on behavioral wearables or wearables that interact through AI with the surrounding and you're taking the whole idea of AI straight onto the body and to our interactions. Now we have that kind of, um, kind of that boundary there when we're doing we're doing it through computers and we're all quite used to having computers and AIs integrated into our social networks and all of our interactions through computer. What do you think will happen when it will go into our wearables? I mean, what do you expect that will happen or what are you hoping to gain through that? I think, uh, yeah, one of the things, if you're thinking about like yeah, big computers and data centers, there's a lot of what I already tried to mention is data mining. A lot of people do data mining. Mm -hmm. um, like AI is not the solution to everything and not everything that you can have access to in data you should uh, have to use, you know. So that really comes towards um, if, if you're working with um, uh, this kind of data on the body, you have like the processors are not as big as big computers. You can store less things. So you need to make decisions. Uh, about uh, what actually of the data that you have are you going to use and I, can, I think that's really interesting because then you're working with a limitation instead of a possibility we have the possibility to data mine whatever we can and uh, yeah we, we we create big server like server but anything you know to to do so uh, but i think it's it's much more elegant to think of just the things that that we really want to use instead of being being greedy for all that data because uh, in the end uh, that that's causing a lot of pollution in different ways so i think uh, automatically by working um, around things on the body you need to make decisions on, on what data to mine and what data to examine and um, all of that stuff which i think is really interesting uh, points you know because how can we uh, on on a, on a bigger scale make 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 that work for for other things as well from the things that we do and, and the things that we data mine almost so do you see the next step when it comes to wearable ais as i don't know to to see it as kind of smaller ais based on smaller databases which will be integrated with human decisions is kind of is that the near future you see um yeah human decision i i, I always talk about like a partnership with uh, with uh, technology i think we uh, should have more partnerships instead of uh, letting us rule technology or technology rule us right so where are those partnerships an interesting case of the spider dress uh, the former one that i created it was an, a black spider dress uh, was five years before i made this one was made from uh, plexiglass and um, it was basically always reacting when people were in the surroundings and i i didn't thought that was fair to the wearer or to the system itself so with this uh, spider dress i uh, i put respiration sensors sensors uh, in the design so when my uh, wearer or my model is talking to somebody she can breathe in and breathe out and the system goes into a sleeping mode so she's almost saying to the system like Shh, instead of pushing a button she can control that through, by through her breathing. breath yeah, so, uh, so in the former design of the spider dress, it was not um, a good symbiotic relationship I found between the wearer and the design, right? So I, I use like the, the, the notion of using this long uh, volume, uh, the respiration sensor in order to uh, create that symbiotic uh, relationship between or that partnership with technology. And I think, yeah, if we can, the more we can think about partnerships with, with um, things that we design, the better that would be sort of, you know, uh, but that, that's one case of, of how I would, uh, yeah, and that's uh, sort of, yeah, try to find these little relationships that we can have new ways almost. Mm. 
I thought I thought uh, the the use of uh, Edward T. Hall's work in that context was really interesting, especially when you kind of outlined the fact that he was measuring it with a stick and you're doing it with sensory. Um, do you feel that through the use of AIs in social interactions will have kind of a, a more, I don't know how to call it, by performative interaction? Because all of your garments bring into them a very strong performative sense. And, and I've seen through your work that you've been working with performing artists, you know, whether through Cirque du Soleil or Pergi from the Black Eyed Peas on, on the NFL. So how, how do you see that interaction of AI and performance in, in the context of, you know, social interaction? Yeah, um, I mean, like my yeah, my research is all about uh, yeah, fashion being expressive. The notion of fashion is already communicating something special about yourself. But what happens if you put electronics on the body? Um, so first of all, like the, the first notion is like technology came into our lives to help us. But when I open my my mobile phone, I get almost a heart attack because this piece of technology is not sensitive to me, right? So when we have these uh, systems that can be and can live on the body, it might be a new device, a new way of uh, communicating expressing ourselves I think that is really my fascination because it is the first time that that our um, main devices might be or, or or our interfaces would be uh, able to really listen to the body and before that it was not possible because technology was not as small you know or the possibilities were, were, were not there necessarily but I think that's the interesting part of um, yeah when um, when when these technologies call on the body the possibilities that it has in 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 these fields you know in where uh, things can maybe sense yourself better than you do you know or predict something mm. um mm. And, and i think that is a new way that we can see these uh yeah new technologies evolve other than sort of the, the devices that we live with right now that are sometimes not very elegant or not not very sensoric and and um that that that, that are not, not super smart in another way they are very smart in one way but they're not very uh, empathic uh, to to uh, yeah to use almost you know so i'm really interested in that new field of uh, of where that meets so that can be an expressive design so something that is it's it's out for the world to see or that can be something very intimate for yourself right uh, maybe you want to see how your body signals are doing and that can be a very intimate experience uh, for yourself so i think there's two ways that i always work with with uh, the extra extrovert versus the introvert kind of notions of these mm -hmm. uh, these designs and i uh, i like to play with that so it's, it's always in the end um what, what's the um end performance or the end user it might be a performance or it might be yeah something that is really uh, close to yourself that that maybe even only you want to know right so um i think within this field of fashion tech that that's what you're playing with with all this whole scenario of of uh, of, uh, of things around that sort of okay I, I see that i've missed a few questions in the q a so regretfully i'll have to relate to the q a and stop a yeah. Uh, stop asking questions. I'm intrigued by um, mm -hmm. anonymous attending. How much do you think sensorial tech will be adopted to our everyday clothing? I mean, do you see that happening? Yeah, what I mentioned, it's it's still a pretty young field. Technology has never been as small. There's a lot of things that we still need to like figure out that we're trying to figure out with the fields. Um, one is uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, one is uh, energizing your design is batteries, you know, uh, the batteries that we currently have, are they really meant for the body? You know, uh, the body wants organic, wants round, uh, wants flexible. Uh, so what's our solutions there from like, uh, yeah, kinetic energy, we all move, we all walk to, um, yeah, having better solutions for batteries. Um, the other thing is washability. That's still a, a big problem that we need to fix because of course we all know that, um, um, uh, yeah, electronics don't really like water <laughs> to say it uh, this way. But I know from the industry, the washing machine industry um, actually they um, they have created machines that you can wash the things that we're busy with, maybe conductive um, threads and all of that stuff. You can wash in machines that don't use water. The problem with that is they're still stuck in laboratories. We cannot use them right now. We cannot uh, walk up to the Best Buy or a tele electronics store to buy them, right? Um, and then the other thing is maintaining, like um, um, what happens if uh, just like your light bulb, if it breaks or, or if 
anything breaks, um, do you send it back? Do you go to a robotic dressmaker, or do you um, uh, are you witty enough to to fix things yourself? Can you reprogram? Can you recode things yourself? Right. So there's still like a few things amongst like some other teams, but these are the the biggest things that we are still working on, and that we also need to limit the industry for as well, of course, you know. And I think uh, besides that, there's so many ideas and there's so much interest and and so many of this, um, but uh, yeah, there are a few things that are still standing in the way to make all these uh, things commercially uh, viable. And the other thing is like we all like to wear maybe an an, um, an, uh, an an activity tracker or something. It's a design that's for everybody almost. Uh, these designs for any design, a flower dress I might not wear or a black dress I might not wear. I, I do, but um, and there's also the notion of that. Uh, yeah, you don't want to bring out one dress that everybody wears because that's almost the shame of the red carpet, right? That that two people have the same dress on. So um, in the end, it's also very customized. Um, ideology of uh, of uh, yeah working around uh like yeah these designs and uh, and all of that stuff but i think uh yeah um better than that i'm also really interested in like the, the do-it-yourself community people that are um yeah making uh, making their own designs and there's a lot of like interesting movements around all of this so it definitely um like yeah has a big future and we're really standing on the um yeah the, the, the footsteps of it but uh, we do need to have uh, much more uh, like discussion uh, but like until like 10 years, maybe eight years ago, technology field was not really interested in it. They got interested in it because other than presenting a, a red fabric dress, it's a dress that can have their technology in there. Automotive got interested and the fashion industry was a little bit later. Uh, maybe like five years ago, they got really interested into the possibilities of it. Uh, but still, it's it's a few years that, that people are really uh, working on this and focused on this sort of, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, but I, I, I just think it's, yeah, it's super interesting and there's so much potential in, in so many ways sort of. And, and I like to yeah wear some certain things myself, you know, like the proximity dress, just to solve some of these uh, social riddles. I might not say to you, hey, you're coming too close into my personal space, but if my mm -hmm. dress or my spider dress is indicating that, I can say, hey, my system is indicating at this point of time that you are coming too close in my, in my personal space. You can almost uh, like blame the system or play good cop, bad cop with your system, right? So I think for me, that's really interesting because we are all taught a certain rules of how to behave. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, if you look at a cat, you come too close to a cat and it gives you an, uh, a claw right so why 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 are our why, why should we live in uncomfortable situation uh, just because we are taught to to do so almost uh, so so i like to solve these these things uh, yeah using using some of that design almost thank you for that hmm. i'm wondering if a social ai should be aware whether someone is from the middle eastern background or an Anglo background, because the social distancing is totally different. Yeah, so, yeah I see that just... when I travel around with my spider dress in America versus in the Netherlands, where I'm from, people oh. are much more uh, close by. And you definitely yeah. see that as Edward T. Hall was traveling around and notices that uh, my spider dress or my designs are also noticing all these cultural differences and personal differences and, and all of that stuff. So it's super interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll just another question from uh, the crowd. Do you consider your clothes as an extension of the human body? Can they provide uh, special, oh, special powers, almost like uh, advanced prosthetics? Um, yeah, I think we, we talk in the fields a lot about um, uh, Luan, uh technology is an extension of yourself. I think it's definitely if you're working on these exoskeletons and all of that stuff, um, it's an it's an extension of the capabilities of your like physically sometimes even you know, um, but but they are also there to communicate. So I would say yeah, it's it's both. Um, uh, yeah, it's definitely both. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Oh, one more, or or are they? Oh, it's a, it's a. Oh, I oh, yeah, <laughs> I took that in the answer. <laughs> it was, it was uh, part of the uh, previous question. But thank you very much for that, Anouk. It was super okay. interesting. Yeah, Love thank you so much for organizing. Yeah, all of you to organize this uh, this conference. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, Anne, are you taking it from here? Uh, it's Arnus who's taking it from here, and Sorry, thanks a Arnus. lot. It was really, really fascinating, both the lecture and the conversation afterwards. So, thanks so much, both of you. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure. It was very interesting, and my personal note would be that I really like the connection between the 
animal behavior and all these uh, machines because uh, my biology is my first degree is in biology and it's actually animal behavior. So I oh. see, I see a lot of connections and I would have had a few more questions, but uh, let's leave it.